We're looking today at the critical political and humanitarian situation in Gaza. Uh, a lot going on in and around uh, the Gaza issue. Uh, tensions between uh, the Palestinian Authority and Hamas, infighting within sort of the uh, Fatah movement itself, uh, shifts in the Gulf involving Saudi, UAE, and Qatar, possibly impacting the situation in, uh, in Gaza. Uh, Gaza has been under a blockade for almost a decade now. Things have recently gotten worse as the Palestinian Authority also is uh, reducing salary payments uh, uh, and uh, sort of asking that less electricity get in. A lot of issues that are impacting uh, is uh, Gaza Strip uh, very direly in this, uh, uh, in this situation. Um, Part of our discussion today is not only to ask how the international community can help mitigate the current suffering, but how do we bring Gaza back into regional and international de deliberations, into some kind of political process? Um, and how does one avoid dynamics that some scholars, maybe some of them even on this panel, are warning could raise the risk of war again uh, after the last war in 2014? Uh, which was very, very devastating on the Gaza Strip, also led to loss of life among Israelis. Uh, we certainly want to avoid another conflagration of that uh, kind. We're very fortunate and pleased to have a very excellent uh, panel with us today. You have their full bios in the flyers that hopefully you picked up uh, upon arrival, but I will introduce them briefly before uh, entering into discussion with them. Uh, Tariq Bakouni, who is immediately to my right, is a policy fellow with Al Shabaka. He's currently based uh, in uh, New York. Al Shabaka is a Palestinian policy network, a think tank without borders, whose mission is to educate and foster public debate on Palestinian human rights and self determination within the framework of international law. Uh, to my extreme left is Lara Friedman. President of the Foundation for Middle East Peace, well known, I believe, to many of you. An expert uh, on uh, congressional views, U.S. executive branch policy towards Israel and Palestine, also on sort of uh, Israeli thinking as well. She previously was with Americans for Peace Now and served with distinction in the Middle East as a U.S. Foreign Service officer. To my immediate left is Mr. Christopher McGrath. He's the acting director of the Washington Office of the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, UNRWA. Uh, which has approximately 12,500 staff and over 300 installations across the Gaza Strip. And UNRWA delivers education, health, mental health, relief and social services and microcredit and emergency assistance to Palestinian refugees uh, in Gaza and elsewhere. Um, and uh, to my uh, extreme right is Mr. Nathan Sachs, who is a fellow at the Brookings Institution and director of its Center for Middle East Policy. Natan has taught at Georgetown, held fellowships at Stanford and in Indonesia, and is currently writing a book on Israeli grand strategy and its uh, domestic origins. I will engage our panelists uh, in discussion for a while and then leave ample time for questions from you, uh, the audience, and we will close uh, promptly at 1.30 today. Uh, Chris, let me start with you. Uh, if you could sort of paint for us a picture of the current humanitarian and, and perhaps economic situation on the ground uh, in, in Gaza, uh, and also a paint a picture of what are the aid flows uh, which are obstructed and which are proceeding, um, and how would you describe sort of the situation since the conflict of 2014? I know there's been a UN report, uh, Gaza 2020, there's been amendments to that. So just start us off with a picture of how you see things today there. Sure, I'd be Thank happy you. to. Uh, thanks, Paul, and thanks to MEI for hosting this today. Uh, as you mentioned, in 2012, the UN released a report called Gaza 2020, a livable place, with a question mark at the end. That's five years ago now. Let me just share a, a brief quote from the report. By the year 2020, the population of Gaza will increase to around 2.1 million. We're already at that number, and it's only 2017. Fundamental infrastructure and electricity, water and sanitation, municipal and social services is struggling to keep pace with the needs of the growing population. By 2020, electricity provisions will need to double to meet demand. Damage to the coastal aquifer will be irreversible, and hundreds of new schools and expanded health services will be needed for an overwhelmingly young population. Since 2012, as you all know, there has been continued de-development in the Gaza Strip, and there's also been conflict uh, in 2014. Uh, during the 2014 conflict there, 
Uh, we had 290,000 civilians sheltering in 90 UNRWA schools. Uh, 86,000 refugee homes were damaged, including 7,000 that were completely destroyed and 5,000 that had major damage to them. And tens of thousands of people still remain uh, displaced from that. In addition to that, there was severe psychosocial distress, particularly on the children. Uh, when we reopened schools, we found that virtually 100% of the children that in our schools uh, experienced some, some signs of uh, PTSD. Um, and there's also, as I mentioned, so been significant de-development uh, since 2012, rather than development, going the wrong direction. Uh, I travel to Gaza pretty frequently, and I can tell you the last few times I've gone there, we see a lot more donkey carts on the street and a lot few car fewer cars and trucks, so people are going backwards, as you can see. Um, official unemployment is currently 32.7% for men and a shocking 67.4% for women. And perhaps most troubling, uh, unemployment for youth uh, aged 15 to 25 is 60%. There's a shortage of skilled personnel, drugs, disposables, and of course electricity, as everybody's heard lately. Uh, just on the current electricity crisis, a couple of notes. Uh, blackouts are running about 20 to 22 hours a day. Uh, that really disrupts people's daily lives. And to put that in a little bit of perspective, people, families in Gaza may have electricity for about as long as this panel discussion will take place today. Um, what we see is families getting up at all hours of the day whenever they do have electricity to scramble to get everything done that they need electricity for. Uh, the, about more than 90% of the tap water is undrinkable for humans, uh, and the desalinization uh, plants are functioning at only 15% of their capacity. And as some of you also know, more than 100 million liters of raw and partially treated sewage are being pumped into the ocean every single day. That's the equivalent of 40 Olympic-sized swimming pools per day of raw sewage going into the ocean. Uh, now, just to go back, as you mentioned also, there was a, an update to this report. Uh, the UN put out an update a few weeks ago uh, to the 2020 report. Uh, and I, I again, want to read one portion of it here. This report underscores that most of the earlier projections for 2020 have deteriorated further and faster than anticipated in 2012. Real GDP per capita in Gaza has decreased. The provision of health services has continued to decline and the demand for additional health clinics, doctors, and hospital beds has not been met. Thanks in large part to the scale of UNRWA's services, Gaza has maintained high education standards, but average daily class time, classroom time for students remains as low as four hours per day. Gaza's only water source is predicted to be irreversibly depleted by 2020. Huge recon reconstruction needs provoked by the 2014 conflict triggered increased imports of construction material to Gaza. However, access to material needed uh, to allow the Gazan economy, infrastructure, and basic, basic services to recover and expand has been highly restricted. So the question that everybody asks is what can be done at this point and, and how, can, how can that be reversed, this trend? Uh, the UN has been asking all actors, including Israel, the PA, and the international community to invest in sustainable development initiatives, which haven't been done as much as needed, uh, to revitalize the economy and perhaps most importantly, to improve the freedom of movement for people and goods, both in and out of Gaza. Uh, and just to return to, to something that uh, Robert Piper, the UN humanitarian coordinator said, the alternative will be a Gaza that is more isolated and more desperate, the threat of a renewed, more, dev more devastating escalation will increase, and the prospects for intra-Palestinian reconciliation will dwindle, and with them the prospects for peace between Israel and Palestine. Thank you very much, uh, Chris. Let me to ask you a number of follow-up questions. First of all, uh, what is your honor was current funding situation, uh, uh, given that you're probably the main source there? Uh, secondly, uh, Qatar used to be, a, and, and is maybe still, but maybe that's changing, uh, has been a contributor and so on. And are the Europeans there in force? Are the Turks there? I'm talking humanitarian. And thirdly, what are the current pathways? Uh, there used to be a lot that used to come through the tunnels from the Sinai, those were largely closed. What is getting through and through which route? So three questions, if I may. Sure, uh, on the, on, I'll take them in order, I think. Uh, on the funding situation, as you know, UNRWA always has a major funding problem. Um, this year, at this very moment, we're facing a deficit of $126.5 million on a budget of about 715 million per year. So it's quite substantial. Um, we are working to, to make that, that budget deficit up. 
and we also expect the next several years to have similar deficits. We, we've calculated that we have roughly a $100 million structural deficit that we face every year, and so that's what we need to overcome now. Uh, and as you know, the United States is the largest contributor to, to UNRWA, representing about 22% of the overall uh, funding for the agency. Uh, in terms of the other donors, we do have quite a bit of support from the Gulf countries. We do have support from the European Union and from the European countries. To UNRWA. To UNRWA. Uh, and so, you know, the European Union itself is usually the number two contributor. And then the European countries, whether they're part of the EU or not, direct to UNRWA usually gives us another maybe 25% of the budget. And then the rest of the world is the additional 25%. So uh, to, to answer your third question here, the, the imports, uh, as you noted, there, there used to be quite a big tunnel economy. Most of those have been closed. The UN never engaged in any tunnel economy business. No, none of the procurement was done through the tunnels. Um, from UNRWA's standpoint, we have a very active and, uh, and coordinated role with the Israeli government. So the materials that we need to bring in for construction or food items or whatever it may be, we have a, a very sophisticated system that we work with Israel on uh, in order to facilitate that. So we don't generally have any problems there, but for the average person, uh, you know, there's a there's as you know a, a dual use list, and so many things that that could be considered having a, a secondary use are blocked at the border on the way in. Generally, foodstuffs and other things like that are able to come in. The the, the biggest problem is most people are unemployed and they can't necessarily aff afford to buy the items that come in. Uh, exports again, though, is the is the the major hindrance here because uh, palace. The, Gaza is traditionally a, a manufacturing a, a, you know, economy, and they export their goods, furniture, uh, clothing, whatever it may be, um, fruit, vegetables. And so without being able to export those goods, uh, the, job, the jobs just aren't there anymore. And their traditional markets had been Israel and the West Bank. And so uh, without the exports, the economy is going to continue to suffer. Mm -hmm. And on the, uh, I mean, you answered as to other donors to UNRWA, but does Qatar or Turkey or the Europeans or anybody else have other aid programs that they run themselves or things they provide directly to Gaza outside of UNRWA? The, yes, there are. And there are other UN agencies also operating in, mm -hmm. in Gaza. So it's not just UNRWA. We just happen to be the biggest uh, because of the scope of our activities. But uh, yeah, the EU and, and Qatar and others give both to uh, other UN. They give to NGOs that operate there uh, for construction or for uh, assistance to the people. Um, and some also support, as you know, the de facto government there mm -hmm. as well. Okay, thank you, Chris. Tara, let me turn to you. Uh, help us understand uh, the very complicated current politics uh, within Fatah itself, or different wings of Fatah, between Mr. Dahlan and Hamas, and now recently meetings apparently in Ramallah between Abbas's people and Hamas itself. Uh, walk us through what, what's going on politically. Why is Abbas? has been doing the things he's doing, is he now shifting? Um, and how does this, you know, how does this play out politically? Okay. Thank you, Paul, and thank you for the Middle East Institute for hosting this panel. Um, I'll try to go through uh, um, a chronological order of how things have been happening over the past six months or so to try to give some context to where we are today. Let's bring your microphone <coughs> closer to you. Oh. Sorry, can everyone hear me this way? Okay. Um, <coughs> So a, lot, a great deal of attention was given to Gaza after the electricity crisis that happened about a month ago. But that uh, was the result of a decision that had been taken by President Mohammed Abbas in the West Bank around April, uh, and it followed from a number of decisions that President Abbas had taken from the beginning of the year. So some of the decisions that uh, Pre President Abbas took included things like uh, restricting the import of medic medicines and medical supplies into the Gaza Strip, and cutting all of the salaries of PA employees, so employees of the Palestinian Authority that are present and living within the Gaza Strip rather than in the West Bank. Part of the decision for President Mahmoud Abbas was animated by financial concerns, uh, allegedly saying that uh, the, the PA has a budget deficit uh, and is attempting to control uh, its payment of employee salaries, which obviously forms a big part of the PA's budget. But the fact that the policies that President Abbas was taken, taking were focused on the Gaza Strip showed that there was a, a concerted effort on his part to increase the isolation of the Gaza Strip and to increase pressure on the Hamas government within Gaza. The third step that President Abbas took was to then ask Israel to stop uh, or to, said that he would stop making payments for electricity sup uh, supply that Israel gives to the Gaza Strip. 
the combination of these three steps resulted in a significant uh, escalation of the humanitarian crisis in the Gaza Strip, the, the latest of which was electricity crisis. So I want to answer the why. Why is President Abbas doing that at the moment? So there's a number of factors. There are local dynamics, there are regional dynamics, and there are international dy dynamics that have been unfolding for at least the past four years, uh, but most, uh, most noticeably since 2014 and since the end of the uh, 2014 war between Hamas and Israel. Uh, immediately, in, in sort of the immediate context in January was the entry of a new American president in the US. Uh, president Trump had uh, already uh, showed signs uh, of uh, wanting to have uh, policies that would produce the ultimate deal uh, between Israel and the Palestinians, uh, and was positioning himself as someone who could provide that deal. Uh, there was also uh, a sense coming from the American administration coming into office that there would be some regional dynamics that would evolve or change, uh, noticeably between uh, America's Sunni allies uh, quote unquote, and uh, Islamic extremists and countries that support um, quote unquote Islamic extremists, including movements such as the Muslim Brotherhood and Hamas. Uh, with, American, uh, with an American policy shifting under the Trump administration, President Abbas most likely took the decision that he wanted to position himself as a strong man on the ground, as someone who is able to uh, implement Trump's um, uh, the Trump administration's uh, agenda on the ground as someone who is able to unify the Palestinian territories and present uh, a single uh, Palestinian voice to the Trump administration and as someone who is able to take strong policies towards the Hamas government in the Gaza Strip. So all that probably formed the backdrop of uh, President Abbas's decision in January to start escalating uh, towards the Gaza Strip. Uh, so that's sort of the international context that was happening, and from there, things started uh, expanding. So we see on the ground that there was uh, a significant opportunity for President Abbas. On the one hand, the Hamas government in the Gaza Strip was quite isolated. Over the past few years, as we just heard, the tunnel economy had been severely uh, impacted, which meant that there were no uh, taxes on merchandise coming through the tunnels. Um, and uh, Hamas's relationship with countries such as uh, Iran and Saudi Arabia were on the rocks. Um, and the, the emergence of the Sisi regime in Egypt me meant that uh, Hamas was also swept up in the uh, policies of uh, marginalizing and uh, repressing the Muslim Brotherhood uh, within Egypt, which meant that the Rafah border between uh, the Gaza Strip and Egypt was closed. Uh, all these uh, factors together <coughs> resulted in a situation where the Hamas government was quite isolated. Uh, so this uh, presented an opportunity for President Abbas. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there was also a, a, an increasing effort by President Abbas's uh, rival, uh, Mahmoud Dahlan, to come back into the political establishment through the Gaza Strip. So there were discussions that were happening uh, between uh, Mahmoud Dahlan and powers within Gaza by the back, with the backing of the UAE and Egypt for Dahlan to position himself as someone who could come back into the political establishment after he'd been ousted by President Abbas. Uh, so both the threat of Dahlan coming into power, Hamas's weakness, uh, possibility the idea, the, possibly the idea of an American administration that would be uh, supportive of some of the policies that uh, President Abbas was taking, uh, all culminated in his decision to increase um, measures that would isolate Hamas and possibly weaken the government to the extent where the PA would be able to come back into the Gaza Strip and take over control of the territories. And of course, what we saw in the Gulf crisis with Saudi Arabia's uh, escalation on uh, Qatar uh, as, uh, uh, as uh, a country that was accused of uh, supporting uh, terrorist organizations, uh, that is reflected within some of the dynamics that are happening in the Gaza Strip. And Qatar's, um, the, the challenge for Qatar now to sort of uh, show that it isn't supporting organizations such as Hamas is only playing in Abbas's hands in terms of further weakening Hamas. 
Um, so that's sort of the context in which this decision happened. Uh, of course, it was a flawed decision for several reasons, uh, which I can talk about, uh, uh, which I can talk about now. And they've actually resulted in uh, they were entirely uh, uh, counterproductive, and they have backfired. Uh, and the situation we see on the ground now is one where Hamas has actually moved much closer to Dahlan and Dahlan to Hamas. Uh, and uh, there's, uh, there's a new alliance that is forming that is presenting a significant threat uh, to President Abbas, uh, who, has now, who appears now to have backtracked on some of his policies and attempted to reinitiate some form of reconciliation government with Hamas. Let me interject a question here. Uh, who's backing, if anybody, President Abbas regionally in his gambit? I mean, it seems UAE and Egypt you know, have been close to Dahlan, uh, Qatar was, was close to Hamas previously and so on. What was he counting on uh, in terms of support? I think that, uh, uh, I mean, I wouldn't be able to directly uh, say, but I think my, my reading of the situation and my assessment of the situation is that there was a calculus made uh, by President Abbas that if he was able to present himself as the secular Palestinian authority that is able to take control of the Gaza Strip and the West Bank, then he would be able to, to uh, enhance uh, the support of countries such as Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. And uh, that even Egypt and the UAE might fall into step if he was able to present a strong hand and demonstrate that he is actually able to take control of the Gaza Strip. Mm -hmm. That calculus has backfired. Um, what has resulted instead was the UAE continuing to support Dahlan as a possible successor to uh, President Abbas, and Egypt coming out more strongly than it ever had before in terms of its support for Dahlan as a successor. So I think Egypt was probably uh, seen as, some, some, as a country uh, that could fall uh, either way, and it's now come out very clearly as a country that is supportive of uh, Dahlan coming back into power. Uh, but I think the important thing to, to understand in, in President Abbas's policies is that in deciding to uh, further increase Gaza's isolation, uh, he bought into the rationale of the blockade, which is that you can increase uh, pressure uh, on a, a population of close to two million people uh, in order to weaken a political faction, or in this case, um, a running government, which is Hamas, Hamas's government in Gaza. So that uh, is, apart from the fact that it's morally reprehensible because it's using a form of collective punishment to achieve uh, a political uh, goal, uh, it has also proven to be flawed. Uh, Hamas hasn't, ha it has been weakened at several times, but rather than collapse or rather than the PA coming back into the Gaza Strip, uh, what we have seen are several uh, escalations of hot wars between Gaza and Israel. Uh, and actually, uh, it, it, this, this reading of Abbas's desire to sort of use the blockade to further weaken Hamas uh, is a misreading of the situation from the Israeli side as well, which is that it has benefited from the separation of the Gaza Strip from the West Bank and from maintaining Hamas as a government. Uh, in Gaza that's able to administer the territories without presenting a security threat to Israel. And so there's a number of factors here that Abbas's calculus have completely misread. Mm -hmm. Well, let me, I mean, ask you a bit also to link it to the politics on the West Bank. Uh, maybe a few words about how do you think the latest troubles on Temple Mount and that area played into the politics? How did different groups try to take advantage of it on the Palestinian side? And uh, uh, maybe a few words about how you see, I mean, Dahlan, what does he have inside the West Bank, Fatah, any, you know, supporters and so on, and Hamas, and sort of Fatah factions, and how you see sort of the future there in terms of Palestinian politics. Um, so in terms of the first question, in terms of how it links into uh, the events that are happening in Jerusalem, I think we would all benefit from going back to April 2014, from the days just before uh, the latest flare-up, or the last flare-up, I should say, between Gaza and Israel. Um, the events that happened in Jerusalem uh, escalated the situation on the ground between Israel and Gaza. Hamas was isolated and weakened then, as it is now. Uh, and it, it was open to a reconciliation agreement then, uh, as President Abbas hoped it would be earlier this year. Um, and there was tension that happened in Jerusalem with the abduction and murder of the three Israeli teenagers. Uh, the same recipes, the same um, 
elements that uh, paved the way for the escalation in 2014 are very much present today. Um, Hamas gets a lot of legitimacy from positioning itself as a movement, obviously, that's protecting uh, Al-Aqsa Mosque and the, the Temple Mount area uh, in Jerusalem. Uh, and so it is an organization that would probably uh, be able to play opportunistically and take advantage of the situation that's happening in Jerusalem now. Uh, I think if Dahlan hadn't come into the picture under Egyptian mediation and the crisis wasn't immediately averted last month uh, with Egyptian fuel shipments coming into the Gaza Strip, that probably would have been the point at which a next war would have escalated. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, I don't think we can separate Gaza from what's happening in Jerusalem. I think they're very connected. A lot of Hamas's legitimacy as a political organization derives from how it critiques the PA in the West Bank, but also how it positions itself as the final uh, front line of resistance against Israeli aspirations uh, as they see it to take over uh, Jerusalem and the West Bank. So that's on, in terms of its connection to the West Bank. Um, in terms of Dahlan, I think it's, 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 a, it's an ironic twist of fate to see Dahlan and Hamas now in, in some form of alliance because, of course, the two are, uh, Hamas is an organization and Dahlan are bitter enemies. Um, because of uh, Dahlan's commitment to security coordination, which goes back to the early 1990s, and under his leadership, there was a, a significant amount of repression that Hamas's members felt in the West Bank particularly, but also in the Gaza Strip. So now there's, there's an opportunistic alliance. Hamas uh, benefits from Dahlan's funding, from the UAE support, and from Dahlan taking on some of the governance responsibilities that Hamas has been trying to shed for years, uh, but that uh, Israel primarily, but also the PA, has uh, prevented it from shedding, because right now it's contained in the Gaza Strip and controlled there. Um, so there's that uh, front, and Dahlan uh, benefits by obviously getting another uh, political entry point into uh, the political establishment. Now, even though his entry point is through Gaza, Gaza continues to be a critical element of the Palestinian political establishment, even though we often think of it as its own problem that's somehow marginal and somehow separated from the Palestinian political uh, establishment, it isn't. And so for Dahlan to gain a strong a foothold in the Gaza Strip is a way to get back into, um, into the Palestinian Authority generally within the West Bank as well. Now, in terms of Abbas, Abbas's legitimacy is extremely, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's facing a very tough line from within Fatah as well, from a younger establishment that have seen his rule as both increasingly authoritarian, uh, but also completely incapable of getting any kind of concessions from Israel. Uh, so if Dahlan is able to position, political, position himself in the Gaza Strip as someone who has political power, my guess is that he would be able to get political support within the West Bank as well. Uh, having said that, there are likely to be other contenders, um, none that spring directly to mind as, as ones that could be uh, as powerful as Dahlan, uh, but, but certainly there would be a power dynamic uh, that Dahlan would have a very good chance of winning. Thank you so much, Tarek. Thank you very much. And Nathan, let me turn to you. Uh, if you could enlighten us a bit, what are the current sort of Israeli discussions, debates about changing developments in Gaza, uh, Gaza, the area that the Israel withdrew from, doesn't have uh, settlers there uh, since then, and yet has had a recurringly troubled relationship. Uh, what are the current debates regarding whether it's the uh, Palestinian Authority Hamas standoff or the Dahlan situation? and the newish role of the UAE and Egypt in some kind of uh, dynamic. What, what is the thinking there and the risk of war discussion? Well, thank you very much, Paul, and thank you to MEI. It's a pleasure to be here. If this is temporary, then I look forward to seeing what the permanent is. <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm on the extreme right. I'll, I think the extreme right will be disappointed, but I'll try and uh, represent it <laughs> just like that. The current status quo, as we heard, I think, from Chris earlier, and as we've all seen, is terrible. And it's terrible, first and foremost, for the people inside Gaza. But for many Israelis, the, the feeling for the past decade, at least, is that it's a, it's a very bad situation. Mm -hmm. So although there may be tactical advantages in containing uh, Hamas, the, the three wars with Gaza have been uh, very damaging for Israel as well. And the Israeli politicians and leaders, including Netanyahu and Yalon, who were in charge in the last round, uh, were very keen on avoiding it, especially them. Previous ones, maybe less. So in Israel, there is a growing recognition that the status quo 
It's not growing. It's long-standing recognition. The status quo is very bad. But as usual, with Israel, the question is always, what's the alternative and is it worse? And so we see a debate inside Israel of how to deal with the status quo. On the one hand, um, there is a desire, widespread desire, to sort of solve what Israelis see as the basic problem, which is uh, a statelet neighboring Israel that's at war with a vastly more powerful neighbor, uh, goes to war every couple of years, is renegade against the PA, has no one gun with the PA, and is therefore almost wherever it would be if it was on the Mexican-American border, uh, anywhere, you would have extremely unstable situation. It would not necessarily take these contours, the blockade might be very different, but you would necessarily have a very, very difficult situation and, and probably war. So the solution from the Israeli perspective, I think also from an objective perspective, would be uh, one Palestinian gun, one Palestinian authority, uh, Abbas or whoever it is uh, controlling uh, the Gaza Strip, an end to a renegade state lit at war with its neighbor. Mm -hmm. Now, no one in Israel, or here, by the way, w it's worth noting, we never assume that Hamas might actually do this, that Hamas might actually say, okay, we won't have a separate military, we won't uh, be a renegade state. We sort of assume that that's a constant, and the question is what else, uh, what everyone else might do. Unfortunately, I think that's true. Hamas is not going to give up uh, its separate power, no matter what the damage is to the Gaza Strip, which is morally reprehensible, but it is a fact. So then the question arises what to do. And sometimes you can hear on the extreme right in Israel, you can hear uh, calls conquer the Gaza Strip, no matter the cost, it's better than going to war every couple of years. Um, but usually, uh, by far, um, more level heads prevail. Uh, the cost, first of all, on the Gaza Strip would be horrendous, but also to the Israeli military would be very different uh, than it was in previous rounds, uh, to the Israeli population. Uh, in the last war, of course, the damage in Gaza was far, far worse than in Israel. Uh, but people in Israel were, in Tel Aviv too, were running to the shelters um, in the middle of the night, etc. Regardless of how it is in Gaza, that's not a situation that's politically viable, certainly in Israel. So the other alternative, how to try to do it, is to try and help the official Palestinian government that's not, at least officially, in war with Israel, and that's the PA. And so then there's this desire, even now, with a, re with a request, demand from Abbas to cut the electricity support. There was actually a debate in the right-wing government in Israel. Yuval Steinitz, who's the Minister of Energy from the Likud, right-wing, um, said we should not acquiesce to this. We should not exacerbate the situ situation in Gaza, even if Abbas does this. We're not beholden to Abbas. But in the end, the Israeli feeling, by and large, is that they're not going to be more pro-Hamas than, uh, than Fatah is, and that they're not going to, and that this is a domestic Palestinian issue, the Palestinians need to solve it. So in short, the result is that then Israel finds itself, um, uh, partly by choice, uh, reverting to this same basic strategy, trying to, to pressure Hamas. After the last war in 2014, there was a marked loosening of the blockade, in part as a lesson of exactly what Tarek was, was eloquently pointing out. Um, Yalon himself, very right wing, I was talking about exactly the, the noose around Hamas and the need not to pressure too hard because then you get into a war you don't want, like in 2014. And so after 2014, you can data from Gisha, for example, uh, which is a, a very impressive organization following exactly uh, inflows the, the real situation in Gaza. Uh, there was a market uh, easing of things, especially on uh, exports that were allowed on some products. Uh, still very far from a lifting of the blockade, and obviously the situation in Gaza is terrible, and part it's gotten worse recently. Uh, so we've had this kind of debate in Israel, but, uh, but by and large, the basic Israeli stance has been still the blockade. Now here's is an interesting irony, and yet you ask what are the debates in this government. The irony is that the ones who are more hopeful about peace, two-state solution down the road someday, the ones who are more uh, prone to Mahmoud Abbas, to trying to help the PA, cooperate with the PA, they're the ones who are often more hawkish on the, on the Gaza Strip, because they take the stance of we need to be with the PA Gaza, with PA, excuse me, PA Ramallah, that um, a separate Palestinian state risks the whole project of trying to achieve reconciliation, or at least some kind of two-state arrangement. The ones who have no hope or desire for a two-state solution with, uh, with Abbas now are singing quite a different tune. So you can hear Naftali Bennett, who is openly opposed to a two-state solution for every possible reason, uh, speaking about a very different position towards, uh, towards the Gaza Strip. Uh, I mentioned Steinitz, uh, Israel Katz, who sees himself as a potential successor to Netanyahu inside the Likud. Uh, he has this grand plan, which is not about to happen, of building an uh, artificial island off the Gaza Strip to allow, the, allow Gaza to have 
an outlet to the world. And so the irony is that sometimes the right wing in Israel now, especially right now, is talking about easing, accepting the status quo because Hamas is not a risk to their plans since they don't really see the two-state solution as a plan. The, the, the simple reality right now is that in this loop of do you try to get out of the status quo, which leads you back to uh, this hope that somehow Hamas would be brought under the fold, which doesn't really happen, of course, and then you turn to Mahmoud Abbas, you constantly, in, in trying to push farther into to resolving this problem from the core, you're risking war each time. Every time you pressure Hamas, there's a risk of war because Hamas cares more about its, its power than the Gazans. So what is it left with? Well, Israel kind of finds itself in this usual sort of conundrum of a terrible status quo, which is not static, in particular because the Gaza Strip is right near centers of population in Israel. Um, the conditions on the ground that we heard are horrendous. Uh, they are also bad for Israel. The, the water of the sea is the same water. It's the water, if you swim in Tel Aviv, it's the same water that can come up the coast. It's very close by. The aquifer is the same aquifer under uh, the southern coastal part of Israel, which is very heavily populated, um, and the Gaza Strip, etc., etc. Uh, a terrible catastrophe of two million people looming is, is terrible for Israel. And the solution, they don't have one. So then comes up this possibility, so that's a bust. Then comes up this possibility of maybe Dachlan. Now, Dachlan is someone the Israelis know. He worked with them in the 90s. He was in charge of security in the Gaza Strip in the 90s. He was then in charge of security in the Gaza Strip later and lost it to Hamas in a very bloody coup. Um, and it's someone the Israelis know, some of them personally. Some of the top Israelis know him personally very well. He's backed by the Egyptians, which the Israelis are cooperating very strongly with, and the Egyptians, um, fighting some of the same uh, enemies that Israel finds. And he's backed by the UAE, which is maybe Israel's favorite Gulfi. Um, so as in that context, if you think of forgetting about the two-state solution, forgetting about Abbas, forgetting about the West Bank, for some of them this looks like an appealing situation. Let me just conclude by saying there's a very difficult dilemma here. I don't think it's that simple. On the one hand, in the long term, the real solution would be to bring Gaza under the West Bank fold. Um, and perhaps it's possible, and I think the parties obviously should do all they can to try and facilitate that. Um, but in the short term, what you really need to do is to try and alleviate the terrible situation in the Gaza Strip and to avoid a much more terrible uh, recurrence of the war. Mm -hmm. And you have a very difficult sort of long-term and short-term dilemma here, which is not simple. I think to my mind, the possibility of another conflict in Gaza and the current situation obviously trump other considerations, and, and things need to be moved rapidly in that direction. But I would just point out it's not a simple thing. Simply jettisoning the Fatah consideration at all, accepting Hamas, which we're all working under the assumption does not care about the people of Gaza, is, uh, is not an easy choice. It might be a choice we have to make, but it's not an easy one. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, uh, Natan. Let me ask a couple of sort of follow-up questions. Uh, on the short-term issue, uh, why hasn't Israel sort of gotten the short-term balance right between Hamas, okay, it's in Gaza for now, what, I mean, what the future holds, we don't know, uh, that doesn't necessarily have an interest in launching a war on Israel, except when it's really squeezed as it has been several times in the past. Uh, and in some ways, Hamas uh, you know, manages some aspects, you know, the Islamic uh, Jihad groups and others, so plays a little bit of a partner role, indirectly perhaps, uh, in, in you know, containing or managing a situation. Why haven't Israel and Hamas found sort of a, a livable balance, uh, you know, call it a long-term truce or something that would seem to be in the interest of both, at least in the short term, since none of the long-term goals seem achievable. Why is it that it's gone to the brink so many times and to war? The other question I wanted to ask, uh, just a question on Turkey, that, you know, Israeli-Turkish relations have gone through a lot of ups and downs, and Turkey has always had an ambition to play some role in Gaza. Uh, just a few comments about where that relationship stands and does it relate to Gaza at all? So first of the first question, um, that's a good question. And I think it, why haven't they reached some kind of modus vivendi where uh, they agree to despise each other across a more or less quiet border? Um, in part, there have been some attempts. So it's worth remembering, after Hamas was, was elected, won the election in Palestinian um, elections way back, uh, there was a modus vivendi brokered by the, the Europeans that allowed the PA to man the crossings and, and things could, could continue more or less as normal with the PA presidential guard facilitating the transfer. The problem is it wasn't stable. And so, so part of the answer is Ramallah. Why haven't Israel and Hamas found kind of modus vivendi? Because there's Ramallah in the mix. 
because a lot of the payment, Hamas doesn't pay for most of what happens in Gaza. Uh, Ramallah pays for it. And as we see for Ramallah, that's not a viable solution. Um, secondly, every time there has been uh, an easing of a blockade, and there have been, especially in recent years, very dramatic changes, um, Israel's really intelligence, but in general, see Hamas preparing for the next round. We don't see ha Gaza flourishing, it is worth noting. Um, so even, for example, the blockade, the really early stages of the blockade, the blockade really comes after the, the coup, and, um, when, when Hamas takes over the Gaza Strip. But the early stages start even earlier, even before the disengagement. They start, uh, when, when uh, P.A. Ramallah was still in charge of the Gaza Strip, and they start after the uh, Gilad Shalit uh, kidnapping, the kidnapping of a, or capture of an Israeli soldier from Israeli territory from a tunnel uh, inside Gaza. So, in short, the Israeli mistrust of Hamas intentions is profound. It's a bit like the Hamas mistrust of, of Israeli intentions. So why can't they find a modus of ending? Because the Israelis are sure that every time they give anything to Hamas, they're simply emboldening Hamas, strengthening Hamas for the next round. Um, I think they probably still do a lot more than they're doing, but, but that is part of the rationale. Um, the second is that it's not completely clear that Hamas itself speaks with one voice. And so there have been attempts in the past for a hudna, for a long-term ceasefire between Israel and Hamas, a variety of different interlocutors. Uh, but even in 2014, when we saw um, a very, Israeli, very heavy Israeli hand in the West Bank contribute dramatically to what happened to the to war breaking out, uh, we saw both parties not really wanting the war. Uh, Netanyahu and Yalon was the last thing they wanted politically. Um, and the political wing of Hamas probably didn't want it either. Uh, but they, had, they didn't have effective authority over their uh, military wing. And so even then, creating a modus vivendi is very, very difficult. And third, the regional dynamic is quite important. Hamas is uh, despised by most of the, the countries in the region, and especially by Egypt. It's worth remembering, Hamas has a border with Egypt, not just with Israel. So the blockade is by two countries. Um, and, and Egypt is, of course, its first priority, perhaps, is a war against the, uh, what it sees as sort of a general Islamist kind of uh, uh, group. Um, and so from the Israeli perspective, one, it, it, I think especially on the right wing, it's an, it's an appealing alternative. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's an Egyptian problem, that the Egyptians solve it. There's no, why should there be any blockade? There's just a border with the largest Arab country, let them flow through there. Um, and secondly, because they don't want to annoy Sisi. And uh, concessions to Hamas, while Sisi was perceiving Hamas as supporting Salafis in the Sinai, his top priority, was not something the Israelis would do. Uh, not to mention all the other uh, countries in the region with animosity towards, towards Hamas. I'll try and be brief, I'm talking too much. Turkey, of course, Turkey and Qatar especially are the sort of outliers in the, in the region. Um, and with Turkey, the relations are very complicated. We have a piece now by, by a colleague of mine just on that. Um, the Israeli-Turkish relations have now sort of come back to some kind of normalcy. Of course, a, lo a lot of the, the instigation for the big crisis was the flotilla to Gaza. Um, Turkey still wants to play an active role, has a lot more affinity towards Hamas than many, uh, many of the other regimes in the region do. Um, the relations between Israel and Turkey, even while politically they were very bad, uh, trade relations were actually good, they were growing. Now the political thing is, is sort of off the map. Jerusalem, of course, complicates things. But by and large, what we're seeing is sort of an agreement to continue as, as normal, to continue in political relations, full political relations, uh, while still a lot of rhetoric that is quite cantankerous, certainly now from Erdogan with the backdrop of Jerusalem. So in short, the Israelis with Turkey, there's not much trust of Erdogan. There's certainly no affinity towards Erdogan. There's not a belief that he will dramatically change his posture. But there's also a, a feeling that constructive relations, economic and other, between Israel and Turkey are certainly in the benefit of Israel and the benefit of Turkey as well. So that sort of continues unabated. Thank you very much, Natan. Lara, turn to you. Uh, your views on, is there an Israeli long-term strategy towards Gaza? I mean, Natan described many elements of it. What's your view of that? And then coming to Washington, uh, does this administration, where does Gaza, does it appear on their awareness radar? Uh, and what is the approach? We know there's an attempt, feeble attempts at reviving the peace process, but where does Gaza figure for this administration? And do you see in Gaza an opportunity for diplomacy or for progress where it might be more difficult even on the West Bank? So sure. what are your thoughts on those sure. issues? Thank you, and, and thanks MEI for organizing this. As I was preparing my thoughts for this event, it occurred to me that this is the first event I can recall in Gaza and Washington in a, in a very long time, which is actually a very telling fact. Um, 
Gaza is off everybody's screen until we start having more discussion about, wow, are we about to have another war, which is kind of striking. Um, I'm old enough to remember a lot of wars in Gaza. Everyone in this room has probably been through the periods of a lot of wars in Gaza. And it's sort of each time like there's a car accident in slow motion and everyone acts as if no one has agency to do anything but wet, watch these, these cars collide or these cars drive into a wall. Um, I think the title of this, this event says a lot, is Gaza reaching a boiling point? As uh, a friend of mine in Israel said, you know, Gaza is not a pot of water. It's also not a lawn that grows up and needs to be mown. It's also not a person who is worrying about their weight, so their caloric, their caloric intake is the question. Um, I, Natan referenced Gisha, um, my friend Tanya Hari who runs Gisha. I talked to her before coming here today and she said, you know, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, um, We've turned Gaza, we meaning all of us, by the way, the international community is complicit in this, we've turned it into the largest controlled experiment with human beings in history, testing what is the behavior and breaking point of two million people as pressure increases over time. Um, and that is a fundamental uh, challenge for all of us in this room. And it would probably be good if we think about it sometimes how we re resolve it before we get to the point of, hey, are we about to have another war. In terms of, and, and I want to start actually with something that's sort of positive and it links to how you open the question, which is, is there an Israeli strategy? And I think Natan covered this brilliantly. When you look at the Israeli approach on this for years, it's really tactical. It's not strategic. Um, partly because nobody really has a good idea how to end this in a way where you don't potentially end up with a situation that's worse on Israel's border, which is an absolutely legitimate concern. Because right now, we're still framing development and humanitarian concerns in Gaza and security as a zero-sum bargain if you improve one, you hurt the other, and vice versa, which is a very problematic way of setting up this calculus, and I think it's, it's fundamentally wrong. Um, and that's something that I think that's where a lot of the intervention needs to be in, uh, in changing that calculus. But the other part of it, and this is where it's distinct from the West Bank and East Jerusalem, is that Israel doesn't have strategic objectives in the Gaza Strip the way it does in the West Bank. There aren't settlements. The settlements are gone. The settlers are pretty much given up. I don't see a great sort of recidivist tendency. So there isn't the wrestling with, well, we have to keep this much space for settlers and what percentage and land swaps. There's none of that. And that actually offers, I would say, um, a ray of hope that there are, there are pragmatic solutions if we can work on it that are available in Gaza that are much harder um, in the West Bank if one were looking for those. At this point, though, we're talking an entirely tactical approach. And the international community, um, including the United States, has acquiesced to that. And in that sense, we are all um, complicit. And we're all enablers in a situation where we can see at any given moment that the situation in Gaza, and the, the horror show in Gaza has many, many authors, let's be clear. Um, overarching authority and responsibility is Israel. And I agree with Natan, Israel has a complicated set of issues to balance, but Israel turned off the electricity, um, which that is, that is a moral choice. And there are arguments for why dealing with Fatah, Hamas, all of this, everyone bears responsibility. Um, and that, that leads to, there are obligations on all sides. But as we look towards the next Gaza war, which for months now, I remember people six months ago saying, are we gonna have another war in the summer? My goodness, if we think there's gonna be another war in the summer, why aren't we doing something to try to avert it instead of watching the tea leaves? Um, seeing things in Jerusalem popping up, um, as other people on the panel said, I think Tarek talked about this. Um, you, know, you can see how these things uh, evolve. The U.S. deserves enormous credit, I believe, and this is something Chris talked about, for not backing away from the humanitarian side of this. Um, our com continued support for UNRWA is something for which we deserve credit. I'm not sure everyone understands how large it is. And I don't know if everyone understands how po much political pressure there is against it in terms of Congress. You have a constituency in Congress and in the Jewish community particularly which says the way to solve the, Israel the refugee issue because there is no really, there's really no Palestinian refugee issue. They've been gone so long from their homes. The way to solve it is just to get rid of UNRWA because if the UN stops calling them refugees, they'll stop calling themselves refugees. It's a very 
attractive solution if you want to get rid of a permanent status issue. It's also total crap. I don't know a single Palestinian who considers themselves a refugee who does so because the UN gives them permission. But that has been constant pressure for more than a decade. Um, and the aid has continued, the American people are committed um, in a way which I think is quite laudable. But this is not simply a humanitarian crisis and simply bandaging it is not a US policy. It's as much a tactical approach as the Israeli approach. And it's getting worse and worse and worse which is where we are today as we talk about when will be the next Gaza war. I think, you know, I was thinking about what I'd want to talk about here because, again, it's been a very long time since anyone's asked me to talk about Gaza. And we're sort of in this, um, this box when we talk about Gaza. Um, I was there, I want to say, two years ago, um, and I visited UNRWA facilities, whatever. I'm one of the only people I know who doesn't work for a humanitarian organization who goes to Gaza. And it was um, a very sobering experience. And coming back, I talked to people. I went up to the hill and talked to people about what I saw in Gaza. And the response I got was, wow, that's terrible. Well, until Hamas is gone, there's nothing we can do. Um, which I found uh, very predictable and, and very um, troubling response in terms of, yes, here are what, here's what children are going through, here's what people are going through, here's the security implications for Israel of a Gaza that is perpetually on the verge of breaking down, here's the environmental risks for Israel. It doesn't matter until Hamas is gone. We've put ourselves in this box. For me, when I talk about this today, and most people know me for the work I do really on settlements in Jerusalem, I have concluded today that Gaza is no longer a separate issue. It is no longer part of the overall peace process. It is a permanent status issue in itself and needs to be treated as one. It has been isolated and separated for so long. It is no less of a permanent status issue than Jerusalem or settlements or refugees. It needs as much attention as those. And for those of us who for years said, listen, Gaza will be resolved in the context of a conflict ending agreement. And that'll wrap it up and then whatever. I, mean, I don't believe that anymore. I don't think anyone can believe that anymore. And there is no solution without Gaza. So for the Israeli right that gives up on the two-state solution, it doesn't surprise me we're hearing some more pragmatic talk. For people who, who believe that somehow Gaza solves the West Bank by, by alleviating the demographic pressures on Israel, again, I'm going to say that's crap technical political term I've coined in this, in this venue. It's crap. You do not get a peace agreement with the Palestinians without Gaza, and you do not get a peace agreement on, Ga with, on Gaza until you start dealing with the realities. And that means, first and foremost, the humanitarian realities, yes, but it also means no longer as an international community, as the United States, acquiescing to the calculus that's been imposed by the parties, by Israel, by Fatah, by Hamas. This is bigger than them. For years, people have said, we, we can't want peace more than the parties. I have said for a very long time, I suspect the international community wants peace more than a lot of the parties, maybe all of them at any given moment. And I suspect that without the pressure and help from the international community, they're not going to get past their objections to dealing with each other. And I don't actually know of any other regional conflict in the world where people have said, you know what? Bosnia, Rwanda, we can't want peace more than the parties. So the humanitarian side, sorry, it's awful what's happening, but as long as you Hutus and Tutsis can't put yourselves together, we can't do anything. This, this has to be done. And whether you're coming at it from a perspective of US national security interest, whether you're concerned about um, Gaza, Sinai, the stability of Egypt and ISIS and all of that, whether you're concerned strictly about the Israel security, environmental, national security stuff, whatever it is, you still get to the same question, which is allowing Gaza to simmer, long grow, whatever you want to do, until we get to the next war is morally abhorrent. It is politically nonsensical. And from a security standpoint, it is self-defeating. Thank you, Lara. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll come back to the question I asked you. Uh, this administration, what yes. are you seeing? What are, you, what are the tea leaves on this administration? And what are the tea leaves on other diplomatic channels that may or may not exist that relate to Gaza or Gaza as part of the broader process? Sure. So I, I 
I said to someone recently, they asked me, what is the Trump administration thinking on X? And I said, anyone who tells you they know what the Trump administration writ large is thinking on X is lying to you. I used to say they're lying to themselves too. Now they're just flat out lying. Nobody knows. And there isn't a single voice. So I mean, I could say, well, I talked to this one person, political or, or actually, you know, it could be someone political or bureaucratic. And it's the same, I have no idea. Um, I can say that I think we are continuing our commitment on the humanitarian side, and that is laudable. And that actually is an expenditure of political capital for which this administration deserves credit. I will say something here as someone who is not a great fan of this administration for a lot of issues, or in general. Um, I will say something to give them some credit, which is on this they're not that much different on Gaza than the Obama administration. Nobody wants to pay attention to Gaza. This is a sinkhole for people politically. There are no easy answers available. Anything you do is going to piss off Israel. It's going to piss off Fatah. It's going to piss off Congress. If you see, and, and by the way, we've is that another that is. I'm sorry. Term? I just I, I've been doing. You know, you do this for enough years. It's like you're just going to say what you think. Um, we but, have set it up that Gaza has no. There's no point of entry from a policy basis for Gaza. We set that up as soon as we put the rules on Hamas. You know, the, the no's, you can't deal with Hamas until Hamas essentially reforms itself and sends all of its people to jail for supporting Hamas. It's simply not possible. If the rules of engagement are we will not engage until the people in charge lock up, leave, and say we're sorry and put themselves in jail, you're saying there's no place to engage. And that, OK, fine. You tried that. You tried it for a lot of years. It didn't work. When I hear discussion on this illustrious panel about the calculations people are making about what's going to weaken whom and when we'll have, I, I hearken back to a decade ago, sitting in a conference in Beirut where Fatah and Hamas were sitting there debating who was going to wait longer and who would be in a better position when the other guy was weaker. That was a decade ago. We've had this game playing for a decade. Someone, I was just in Ramallah, and I, I asked somebody about the, the electricity uh, issue. And, and they weren't defending it. This is someone on the inside. But they were saying, it's basically a failed policy. If we were going to do this, we should have done it 10 years ago. Now it's a failed policy. Well, maybe. It still would have been immoral 10 years ago. But at this point, we've been down this road over and over. There's always a little bit difference on the margin. Now Dahlan is the new different factor. Is Dahlan and the Emirates going to turn this enough that the Fatah-Hamas calculations fundamentally change and suddenly one person gets to be in charge and we have a new point of entry? I guess we can hope for it. As an analyst, I find it extremely improbable that outside some serious intervention from the outside world saying, you will move this direction. There is a benefit to you if you do. There is a cost to you if you don't. I think we're just, you know, same, same war, different day with slightly different effects and the same horrific impacts on the ground. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Lara. Let me now turn uh, to the audience uh, for questions. There are roving microphones. Uh, raise your hand so I can see the gentleman in the far back. Introduce yourselves. Introduce yourself and ask your question, please. Okay, um, my name is uh, Lu Jaffe. Um, I used to travel to Gaza regularly in 2013 and 14 for news reports. My question is about Hamas as a terror terrorist group. Um, the EU top court has recently ruled to uh, keep Hamas on the terror list, and uh, there's no possibility that the United States is gonna drop Hamas off the list in the near future. So my question is to, to end the Gaza uh, blockade, is there any specific step like, uh, is this a prerequisite to at least for the world to recognize that Hamas as not a terrorist group? We know that things are, the, the two things are, are related, but how close, how closely are, are the two things related? Thanks. Thank you. Uh, there's a gentleman right next to you since the microphone is already in that neighborhood. And then I'll come uh, over here. Okay. My name is Bill Mahail. I teach at George Washington University. I have a quick question. How will the Syria situation impact the Palestinian issue, considering that you have Russian troops, American troops, Kurdish troops, uh, Turkish troops, and also the forces loyal to Assad? Thanks. And thank, thank you for your good talk. Thank you. Uh, over here, the gentleman in the second row. Two gentlemen in the second row. Gentleman in the red shirt first. 
I'll ask the panelists, you know, take note of the questions. We'll come back to you. I am Ra <coughs> sorry, I'm Rafi Danziger, an advisor to APAC. And my question is with regard to the security cooperation between the IDF and the Palestinian security forces. Of course, we know that Abbas suspended it uh, for a while and temporarily, and it's now back on. But how safe is, uh, how secure is a security cooperation? If there are more crises like the one we had, will Abbas be able to continue it, or will the pressure on him to stop it uh, be such? He will, he will just have to stop it. Thank you, Mr. Denziger. Gentleman on the second row as well. My name is Asaf Shah. Just came from Kerem Shalom, and there is no blockade. I think it's a myth which means everything that the Gazan want, the Gazan get through Israel. Okay, there is a very nice situation there where we have a thousand trucks every day with everything that they need. Israel only looks at the military stuff and very small stuff. If they want to do drones, no. If they want to have electronic system for missiles, no. But if you want to have juice, eggs, whatever you want. So there is a myth. If tomorrow Israel opens the borders or Egypt opens the borders, the situation will not change. The blockade is not a problem. Thank you. Uh, the lady in the third row. Uh, my name is Maha and I'm from the DC Justice for Muslims Coalition. I have a couple of questions. One on the definition of a renegade state um, that was referred to as Hamas. I'm wondering what exactly that definition is, because when we think of Israel, um, a country that continuously violates international law, um, you know, destroys uh, the infrastructure of Gaza, kills civilians, et cetera, um, I think we have to think about what the construction is of a renegade state. Secondly, um, I'm a little surprised in this panel that it seems like we're talking about Palestine and Israel um, as if they're equal parties in the conflict. Um, and it's clearly the case, obviously, that Israel has the power to um, sort of mitigate the conditions that Palestinians are facing. So I'm, I'm kind of curious as to why um, the comments were kind of tilted in that regard, because um, I think that that's a huge oversight. And um, with regards to, um, you know, the U.S.'s role in, in funding UNRWA, for example, um, while you said it was laudable, I also wonder how does that then work out with um, the billions of dollars of military foreign aid that uh, the U.S. provides Israel with. Um, that seems rather counterproductive. And then lastly, um, in terms of, you know, thinking about Gaza as a humanitarian crisis, we're not talking about, like, the Gaza, there was a hurricane that went through Gaza, right? We're talking about a, a humanitarian crisis caused by state violence. So I want to, I'm hoping that um, I can hear from you all as to how we address a humanitarian uh, crisis in that regard. Thank you, Maha. Let's go to our panel. Lot of Start with you and we'll move in that direction. Choose so, any of the questions you want to respond to. Sure, unfortunately I can't read my handwriting um, well, from the questions good. that I just <laughs> wrote down. Um, so first of all, I actually want to start in the back because I think it's a key question, the question of Hamas as a terrorist group and, and other people can talk about, you know, you, I think Chris can probably address um, the whole issue of the mechanism for re reconstruction and the limits that are put on uh, dealing with Gaza because Hamas is in charge. I mean, Hamas is a terror organization because they engage in terrorism. Um, whatever you believe, I mean, in terms of Israel's um, relationship with Hamas and what it should be, and the fact is Israel does deal with Hamas and Gaza, let's not pretend they don't. It's the United States and the international community that say zero, zero, zero contact. But the fact is Hamas has supported devastating terrorism inside Israel. And I would argue that shooting missiles, shooting rockets, unaimed into civilian areas is definitionally terrorist activity. Um, that is not resistance, that is not self-defense. When you are just shooting things up and wondering where they'll land and you're aiming them towards populated areas, that is terrorism. Um, that being said, the fact that the West Bank Sorry, the fact that Gaza is under the control of Hamas doesn't mean that the entire population of Gaza is now guilty of being terrorists or that it is legitimate or legal or moral to inflict collective punishment. I mean, this is, we've been having this discussion since the PLC elections in mid-2000s, right? Hamas won those elections fair and square. I was on the ground as an election observer. They won them fair and square, not because they were holding guns to anybody's head. And suddenly it became, well, the Palestinian people deserve whatever they get 
because Hamas, which by the way ran as the party of change and reform, correct, yes, change and reform, running against, not running on an Islamic terrorist slate, but running as the anti-corruption party. Obviously they had another agenda as well. Um, suddenly saying, well, two million people in Gaza, essentially the political horizon for them is erased because Hamas is a terrorist organization, and the world will basically, you know, throw a little bit here and there to try to keep them from really dying. It's what Maha said, this is a man-made humanitarian uh, crisis. Um, and it, it's, it's just, I, I'm, not, I'm not an expert on every conflict in the world. I cannot think of any conflict where the world has essentially said, we hate the ruler, so we are actually going to abandon the people completely or almost completely in a conflict where we are actively supporting, by the way, one side militarily and security perspective. Um, it's, it, it, does, it doesn't hold up as, as logic and it doesn't hold up as a national security construct for the U.S. Thank you, Lara. Chris, any comments? Particularly maybe the issue of the blockade, uh, you know, what, what impact does it have? And, and also issues of, you said there's been de-development since uh, 14. Could you say a bit more about that and how do you see potential reconstruction or de development? Sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, you know, in the blockade, I've, I've been to Karim Shalom as well, and it is quite a quite a impressive arrangement that they have there for for imports. Um, you know, the problem, as I mentioned in in our earlier mm -hmm. remarks here, was uh, it's not the imports that that is fundamentally the problem. There are challenges, and those are being worked through. Uh, there are items available to, for purchase. It's the exports, and it's the economy. So, if you, as I said, if you can't afford the products, you can't buy them. Uh, and just a, an example here. Um, two million people in the Gaza Strip. My organization feeds one million people in the Gaza Strip. That's half of the population. Uh, and WFP, that's, that's, we only feed refugees. WFP feeds about another 250,000. So we're talking about 1.25 million people out of a population of two million that needs, that relies on UN food assistance. Uh, so it's not that, that, the, that there's nothing on the shelves. Um, you know, so it's, it, and it's also not just the movement of goods, but it's specifically even more important, the movement of people. Um, prior to the blockade, uh, there were roughly 100,000 Palestinians that worked in Israel. Um, if anybody's been to the Arabs crossing, the border crossing, it's evident that that was built with the, a view to having masses, massive amounts of people crossing the border. It's, a, it's an enormous, enormous place. Uh, every time I go there, it's empty. Uh, it's, it's barely, barely anybody there. Um, but you know, part of this is if, if the economy is going to recover, there needs to be this exchange and this movement of not only goods but people, and not only goods going in but goods going out. And so I think that's the critical, uh, the critical component of this. Uh, in terms of the reconstruction, um, we have a part of the role in the reconstruction of, of shelters, of housing in Gaza. Uh, we don't have the full control of that system. Um, the Gaza reconstruction mechanism is, is overseen in part by the UN. Uh, and it is a very tight regime, I can tell you that. It's very strict on where the material goes. Uh, the arrangement we have, for example, with Israel on importing concrete and other, other materials, uh, it involves video cameras, watching the materials. We have to certify using international staff members about where the material is, photos of walls we've built with concrete, uh, matching that up with the amount of concrete that we've requested. So it's a very tight uh, uh, regime and of course the the, uh, the those are all done for security reasons for Israel. They don't want any of the the materials used for for construction to be uh, diverted for other uses. So um, you know I think there's there's also we we see while there are in infrastructure projects taking place uh, and we do quite a few of them. We even do some additional ones that uh, aren't necessarily directly related related to, to refugees in Gaza. Um, there's a hesitancy for many donors to invest heavily in infrastructure in Gaza. Uh, who's going to control it? Who's going to run it? Who's going to operate it? Who's going to ensure it's sustainable in the long run? What happens if there's another conflict? Are we going to rebuild? Are we going to? Is it going to be destroyed and then we're going to have to rebuild it again? So there is some of this hes hesitation on behalf of many in the inter international community to actually address the the, the really underlying infrastructure problems. Uh, you know, and then you talk about the humanitarian issues and 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 you know, trying you know, part of that is employment, but. Uh, you know, again, there's no jobs, and, and you can't just create jobs. I mean, we have we have the the second largest we're the second largest employer in Gaza. We represent about 11% of the GDP, which is 
uh, outrageous that a UN agency does that. Um, so I think until those can be systematically addressed, uh, it, it's, it's not going to really solve, solve mm -hmm. the issue. Thank you, Chris. Tara and Nathan, comments on some of the questions? Yes, I'm, I'm going to try to comment on a, a, a question sort of collectively and some of the things that were spoken about on this panel um, th th that, you know, give, give me a number of thoughts while everyone was speaking. So I think it's really important to understand, sorry. So I think it's really important here to keep taking a step back and understanding the broader context in which all of this is happening. Defining Hamas as a terrorist organization, whether you support that or you don't support that, in my mind, is a red herring because it has created a situation where everything that Israel does towards the Gaza Strip is excused. It becomes excusable under the fight of terrorism or the fight against radical Islamic tr groups or uh, any kind of policy that aims at uh, and is seen through the prism of fighting terror becomes excusable. So, you know, before Hamas, uh, and Gaza being a terrorist haven, there was the PLO and the Fida'iyin, and it was a, a Fida'iyin haven. And when Hamas was a terrorist organization, it was also an Islamic emirate, and it was also a renegade state. And there's all these terms that keep getting, you, that keep getting used that appear to justify a policy that's put in place to uh, maintain Gaza as a problematic enclave that is separate from the rest of the Palestinian territories. So what that has created is a situation where we're not actually talking about conflict resolution. We're not talking about trying to resolve uh, the political drivers of the conflict. We're talking about conflict management. We're saying we're going to keep the Gaza Strip. You know, we spoke a bit about the, the tactical issues and the absence of a long-term strategy within Israel and the fact that you know Israel had debates internally about whether or not to increase the isolation of the Gaza Strip. And, you know, suffering through some of the security measures. But all of those are operating within the context of wanting to have a Palestinian authority in the West Bank, which is committed to security coordination and which maintains Israel's security in the West Bank, while having an authority in the Gaza Strip that is uh, actually uh, anti uh, concession, has refused to recognize Israel, is, uh, committed to armed struggle against Israel, and suggesting that that organization then represents the two million Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. We can keep all of that under blockade, leave it on the side, and this way we can manage the Palestinian territories without allowing them any form of unity and without addressing the political drivers that animate uh, what Hamas as an organization is. Uh, so we can think whatever we want to think about Hamas. I personally find many of its uh, policies despicable. But that doesn't mean that Hamas doesn't have legitimate political goals that were called for by the PLO before Hamas, and that if Hamas were to be defeated now, would, we, would be called for by some organization after Hamas. So rather than fixating on this idea of how do we you know, the zero-sum game between Fatah and Hamas and how to, do we manage the situation in Gaza, how do we ensure security, we need to be thinking about what the underlying political drivers that give rise to organizations like Hamas are to begin with. Uh, and the fact of the matter is, Israel is an occupying state and Gaza is still under occupation. So when we talk about collective punishment and we, when we talk about Hamas not caring for the people under its rule, Israel, as an occupying force, has a responsibility to people under occupation by it. The Palestinians in Gaza are still occupied by Israel. And so this idea of collective punishment is actually in violation of international law to begin with from the side of the Israelis, regardless of what Hamas thinks about uh, the people under its rule. The, the one other thing I want to say is, you know, we can talk about, uh, we can talk about um, Hamas not caring about the people under its rule. We can talk about Hamas being a terrorist organization, Hamas being illegitimate. The fact of the matter is that many people that I spoke with in Gaza despise Hamas. They also despise Abbas, and they also despise Israel, which is the biggest architect of this sort of occupying uh, infrastructure and, and framework around the Gaza Strip. But when wars flare up, people support the resistance. And there's a reason for that. It's not because all the people in the Gaza Strip and all the Palestinians are terrorists. 
They support the resistance because there are legitimate internationally sanctioned rights, including the right to self-determination, the right of return, the, the, the core tenets of the Palestinian struggle. So whether those are couched in Hamas or couched in Fatah or couched in lone wolf attacks, those will always be there. So instead of talking about this idea of managing Gaza, you know, Israel is in a difficult position because it has to deal with this internal Palestinian struggle. In reality, there wouldn't be that situation of if Israel were to end its occupation and get in line with international law and with American foreign policy, which continues to call for a two-state solution. So if there is any sort of desire to genuinely end this situation in the Gaza Strip, the way isn't to focus on Hamas and stop defining it as a terrorist organization and engage with it and all those things. Those would be prerequisites, in my opinion. But it would be to deal with the Palestinian issue writ large as a political problem that still has uh, international law or demands that are supported by international law that Israel continues to sidestep and circumvent in its so-called fight against terror. Thank you, Tarek. Thank you. Thanks. There's a, there's a lot to deal with. I, I won't cover everything. So first, the question was asked about renegade province. So renegade province is a technical term, and it's actually it's actually not a question of uh, Israel's determination or my determination. It's a question for the PA to decide. So a country, a province that is a renegade province usually would be one that's ruled by a uh, rebellious uh, military, and that would entail very dramatic, if the PA were to declare Gaza a renegade province, it would entail very dramatic sanctions against uh, Gaza, in particular stopping paying things from Hamas. So for, sorry, from Ramallah for things in Gaza Strip, something the PA has not done. So the PA has not declared Gaza to be a uh, province in rebellion, and in part because it continues to pay and it doesn't want to exacerbate things, but we're seeing there's a change in that. But I think there's a more important um, sort of undertone to the whole question. Renegade province or any other determination or calling Hamas terror organization, other, I think we're missing the point. There are two million people in a very difficult, terrible uh, situation. There is also, um, might, can care or not, uh, but I think one should. There are also people neighboring Gaza and Israel that also are in a much better situation than people in Gaza, but also find themselves every two years running to the shelter. So the question of who you hate more is Israel, you know, should, you're saying Israel, we should hate more than we hate Hamas or Hamas. Is, that's kind of beside the point. The question, okay, well, if Israel is, I apologize then. So um, whether or not we, uh, whether or not someone hates Israel more, hates Hamas more, or someone, that really is beside the point. The question is what the, what the parties can do. And uh, it's important to remember a few things. First is that the stronger party, uh, as you mentioned, Israel is definitely the stronger party. It has many more believers of power and therefore also has a moral responsibility for a lot of things that happen. But it's a terrible mistake. It's just the soft bigotry of low expectations to think that the Palestinians have no agency at all. The decisions that Hamas makes versus the ones that the PA make have no effect on things. After all, life in the last decade has been uh, very bad in the West Bank. It's been light years better than the Gaza Strip. And the same evil Israel is dealing with both of them, evil in quotations, right? So something about the decisions in Ramallah and Gaza has been different and has had a real effect on the lives of millions of people. And so we can argue about who's to blame and who's to not, but I think really we should focus on the important thing, which is a dramatic crisis of people. And so historic uh, quibbles about who's responsible for what. There is also agencies to the parties. The evidence of that is the question of the terrorist organization. Whether it's a definition, you know, do you define it this way or not? I think maybe relevant is whether it uses terrorism. But that should not be relevant, I think, to whether one deals with the reality that Hamas is there, has a lot of power, should be dealt with, should be spoken to. Not because anyone likes it, I don't but because it's a reality. We speak to many regimes, many organizations that we hate with good reason, uh, but we still deal with them in reality. I would say about the blockade, there's a, there's a lot of words that are usually thrown around. People sometimes say there's a siege of Gaza, and a siege of Gaza would mean that you're trying to starve the population into submission. That doesn't exist, because Israel through Karim Shalom is sending a lot of food, allows a lot of things to happen. There's clearly a blockade. The Israelis define it as a blockade and have legally, uh, after the flotilla incident, for example, uh, gained sort of legal recognition that 
fighting a statelet, it's not quite a state, a statelet that's fighting it, blockade is one of the things that you do in war. The US has done it with Cuba, uh, many countries have done it with many others. The problem is that we have this no man's land of 10 years of a, block, a partial blockade by Israel and Egypt against the Gaza Strip with no clear resolution. Israel is not intending to conquer the Gaza Strip, remove Hamas and end things. It's not intending to uh, simply let Hamas do whatever it wants and, and attack Israel. Because even if it's much, much weaker, uh, no country, the US, Denmark, anyone, would allow a neighbor to attack it even if it's much, much weaker. If Tijuana broke from Mexico with its own thing and started shelling San Diego, the US would do something about it. Um, now, should it do a 10-year blockade? I think not. I think things need to be changed dramatically, but it is not um, because there is no Palestinian agency whatsoever, nor is it that, the, that Israel is not the stronger power. I'll try and end quickly. Um, so I hope I've angered, angered people on both sides enough. Um, inshallah. Inshallah, yeah. <laughs> Security cooperation, uh, I think this is a crucial question in, in the West Bank. I don't know, it depends, I don't know the PA very well, but I think this is a crucial question and it's especially one when we look at what's happening in the Gaza Strip. Uh, and when we think about what happens in the West Bank, which we saw can lead to the Gaza Strip very quickly. We are entering a very dangerous period, not only with Gaza, but with the West Bank, and these things are closely tied to one another. The possibility of transition to the Palestinian Authority, of ending a security cooperation, of what might happen with security apparatuses uh, is crucial. I very much hope the cooperation continues. It is normalization, it is you know, cooperating with the Israel, um, uh, and I think that's a good thing. I think it has allowed the West Bank to be vastly better than the Gaza Strip, although it is certainly not where it should be, which should be an independent state alongside Israel. Thank you, Natan. We have seven minutes left. I'll take two questions and then uh, to the floor. The gentleman in the fifth row. That gentleman. Uh, microphone, please. I'm Roland White Robinson, uh, representing the National Council on U.S. Arab Relations and Gulf State Analytics. Um, in regard to the Qatar crisis, what would an elongation of that event mean for Gaza? Are there any quantifiable impacts that we can expect if it lasts for months or years, as has been kind of indicated? Thank you. Uh, gentleman in the front here. That gentleman, yes. Is it on? Yes. You. Yes. <laughs> Salam alaikum. Welcome to the Middle East uh, Institute. Speak into the microphone <coughs> and introduce yourself. Welcome yourself. to the Middle East Institute. My name is Hassan. I was born in Tehran. I represent Global Bridges for Humanity. And our logo is use your tongue, not your gun. But the problem of what is going on in Palestine did not exist 100 years ago. I am sure 100 years from now, it will not exist either. Quick question because we don't have question time. is this. Yes. For sixty years of negotiation, we have got nothing. When is the more powerful partner, the occupiers of Palestinian land, gonna realize that this cannot go forever? Either they have to live together or they're gonna die alone. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman who did hold the microphone briefly, so acquired the right. Thank already. you for doing this. It's yes. Safan, Safan Lavardi, uh, news correspondent for Andal Agency. And uh, I have a question actually for uh, Mr. Sack and uh, 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 Mr. Freeman. Um, after I talked to one of the Jew rabbi, uh, rabbi uh, he said the reason of the Israeli attacks on Palestine is not only because of the Hamas, but also for the sacred, holy promises that Israel wants to achieve in Jerusalem and Palestine. So, uh, and whenever Gaza and Palestine get attacked by Israel, Israel obviously blames uh, Hamas. So do you really think that Israel will stop its attacks and uh, uh, occupational mindset in Hamas, uh, uh, occupational mindset if Hamas decides to uh, dissolve itself? Thank you. Uh, we have one minute each for our panelists, and then you can ambush them in the hallways afterwards. Not that. Um, okay. Uh, well, the question of occupation, of Israeli occupation of the, of the Gaza Strip, and um, when will it uh, finally understand to end it? Uh, Israel, as perceived as an occupier of the Gaza Strip, rests on what, really? It's worth unpacking that for a moment. So Israeli troops are not in the Gaza Strip. Settlements are not in the Gaza Strip. The border is partly closed, but that is actually perfectly normal between two countries, right? The border in many countries is closed. Uh, the main difference is the sea, the question of sea access and air access. That's where Israel has some effective control, right? 
That's basically the core of all we're talking about when we're talking about Israeli occupation in the Gaza Strip. So I'd be very, very cautious on using that word because Israelis time and time again, if you say Gaza and Israel, you don't need to explain the full argument. It's completely obvious to Israelis. No. But I understand, but we have very few minutes. You can discuss later. Nathan, really no, I didn't say it's minutes. not occupation. Yeah. I said the occupation boils down to that. That's what I said. Okay, maybe there are invisible settlers there that I don't know of, but assuming there are no settlers in the West Bank that I don't know of, it boils down to the effective control over the territory, that's what these organizations talk about, which is the air and the sea. It's not the border with Egypt, which Israel doesn't control as far as I know, maybe I'm wrong. There are no settlers that I have seen, there's no military troops inside Gaza that I have seen. It boils down to the effective control, which is what? The sea and the air. This is what it boils down to. And it's dangerous to use this um, to use this rhetoric of Israel is responsible for absolutely everything because it weakens the possibility of convincing Israelis that if occupation ever ended, something would change. In Israeli minds, they pulled out of the Gaza Strip and what resulted was worse for Palestinians and also for Israelis. And therefore, we need to be, I think, very, very careful about this. When would Israelis change their mind? In their thought, it's around August 1993 when they decided to engage the PLO, accept the idea of two, uh, 242 had already been accepted, um, and in uh, 2000 and later, accepted two-state solution. Um, has this happened? No. Has Israel done everything it should? Absolutely not. But let's not forget there have been two parties to these negotiations that have broke down, six different Israeli prime ministers, etc. I just want to point out, what's happening here is that we're arguing about who's, the, who's right and who's wrong. Is Israel evil? Is it occupying or not? And again, I think that is not the question. We need to be asking ourselves how the actual situation of real people is improved. Um, and this, okay, I'll stop it. Yeah. Time is short. Got it. Okay, so since time is short, I'll just, um, I'll, I'll, I'll be quite quick. Um, I think this is where probably Natan and I disagree. Uh, it's not just about making the lives of day-to-day uh, -day inhabitants better. It's about giving them political rights and full equality. So in the West Bank, the lives of people could be better, but they're also committed to security coordination. You're also uh, unable to live and uh, uh, maintain a semblance of uh, life that is uh, devoid of occupation and devoid of Israeli control into your everyday life, including through checkpoints, including through home demolitions, including through whether or not you're able to go study abroad. So this idea that, you know, if life is better, then everything is okay, is fundamentally inaccurate. And then the, the, the fact that, you know, the first intifada happened in 87 that led to the Oslo Accords, it was a, a, a rupture of this idea that when life is better, um, you know, people will stop uh, demanding political rights. People will continue to demand political rights. Uh, that's not happening in the West Bank, and it's definitely not happening in the Gaza Strip. Um, in terms of the idea of occupation, there's a vast body of literature which shows why the Gaza Strip is occupied. It's not only the sea and the air. It's also the fact that, you know, if you have cancer in the Gaza Strip, you're not able to get chemotherapy because Israel doesn't allow you to leave. Uh, to my mind, at least, that's a form of occupation. People who are born and raised in the Gaza Strip would have to register within Israel to be allowed to get some form of identity at some point. So Israel is the body that's able to give people registration. It maintains the population registry. That's another uh, way in which Gaza is occupied. Um, I think I'm going to end with this final comment here about you know uh, when will uh, when will the situation change? I think it's. I'm in no way shying away from criticizing the Palestinian leadership. I think half of uh, my talk in the beginning was about doing just that and about the fact that the Palestinian struggle has uh, devolved into some sort of a factional zero-sum game between Fatah and Hamas. Uh, but ultimately, until the average Israeli starts uh, seeing the impact of the occupation on their life and are unable to go to their coffee shops in Tel Aviv or go around Jerusalem without seeing that they are fundamentally electing and supporting governments that are maintaining the occupation until that shift happens within Israel, uh, then the occupation is actually quite sustainable. And we've been saying, you know, for the past uh, 60 years or 50 years since 67, but also since 48, that the situation is not sustainable. It's actually very sustainable. And until the cost starts changing for Israel, things aren't going to change on the ground. Thank you, Tare. Uh, Chris and Lara, last words? No, I'll yield back my minute. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so Lara. I want to close by going back to what I said before, which is I think Gaza has to be woven back into the discussion of resolving the Israeli-Palestinian conflict as a whole. 
you know, we're talking right now about whether or not we're, when, not even whether, when will be the next war in Gaza. But a week ago, we were talking about whether or not Jerusalem was going to completely explode and we were going to see an intifada across the West Bank. Um, we've had a low level sort of quasi mini intifada, which has bubbled up for the past three years around Jerusalem. We've, when we talk about lone wolf terrorism, that's not from Gaza. That's from the West Bank, and it's happening in East Jerusalem. Um, this comes down, and I, I agree with a lot of what both of my colleagues said, even where they disagree with each other. Um, the immediate challenge when we look at Gaza is clearly humanitarian. If you, you, You'd have to be a sociopath to look at Gaza and not feel um, not just terrible, but some sense of human responsibility for trying to, to make things better. But the reality is you can band-aid it all you want. What's absent overwhelmingly, the overwhelming absence here is a political horizon. And that's absent not just in Gaza. It's maybe more obvious that it's absent in Gaza, because there's really nothing. There's not even a pretense of a political horizon. But it's long been absent in the West Bank and for East Jerusalem as well. And again, I'm old enough to remember the logic after the after Hamas took over Gaza, which is the international community is going to shut out Hamas, and people will see how bad life is in Gaza while we let life flourish in the West Bank. And I've watched the past 10 years as life in the West Bank has basically seen the political horizon for ending occupation disappear, settlements constantly expanding, Area C being depopulated. I mean. Let's be honest here. That wasn't even a real, I mean, you, if, if that had worked, if we had seen Gaza turn, Gaza turn into this difficult place and the West Bank turn into Hong Kong, you could have said, all right, this is maybe a winning strategy. People will see that turning away from Hamas has benefits. But Abbas has no credibility in the West Bank. Spend some time there. Get outside of Ramallah and talk to people and don't go to Rawabi. As exciting as it is, Rawabi is not an example of what's happening in the West Bank. The area in the South Hebron Hills and in the Shiloh Valley is a much better example of what's happening in the West Bank, where you are seeing huge areas of what should be a future Palestinian state, if anyone is serious about a two-state solution, being effectively depopulated. In the Shiloh Valley, it's happening, essentially, I was joking with someone, you don't need very many settlers. If you can have outposts, which are like pins with string, and you use the pins and string backed by the IDF to take over massive areas. And you have the Israeli government passing laws which suspend the rule of law to allow this to continue. Fundamentally, you asked, what about the religious side, even if Hamas goes away, even if we have a viable peace plan? What about the religious side? Some of my best friends in Israel who are on the left are deeply committed. I mean, if you talk to, it doesn't matter, we all know these people, who come at it from a position of real love of the land. I mean, let's not forget Hebron is the, the cradle of Judaism. It's, it's not, it's a, Hebron, the tomb of the patriarchs. The idea of giving up control of Hebron is very painful if you're religious at all. Even if you're not religious, you should understand why there's a connection for the Jewish people to Hebron. But when I talk to my friends and they say, I dream of the day when I can come back to Hebron and be welcomed in not as an occupier, but as a person with a legitimate right and a legitimate history here, that's what they're fighting for. And I think that strand of religious commitment to the land does not demand perpetual occupation. At the end of the day, though, humanitarian, obviously, but the political horizon across the board, that is what we always get back to. And after every war, that's what we're going to be still missing until we, until somebody resurrects it um, for the Israelis and Palestinians alike. Thank you, Lara. This is really. It's been a very excellent and a sobering panel. I want to thank you all for coming. And before thanking the panel, if you could stay seated, please, for a moment before we finish. I wanted to again thank the George and Rhonda Salem Family Foundation for its support and our MEI board member. Uh, Mr. George Salem for his continued support and uh, please join me uh, in thanking this excellent panel.